Good. I want to let you know uh, two announcements. Number one, we will have representatives right outside under one of the tents for Crescent City Christian School. If you're interested in that, you can stop right out there on your way out and speak to one of them before you head out today. Secondly, I want to encourage you to turn your attention to our bulletin article today. It's written by Pastor Dennis. It's referencing our church's uh, annual ministry support plan, which we'll be voting on next weekend. But it also has some information about our Kenner campus, which we're going to be having a, a vote at the same time to borrow some additional money, $1.5 million to continue to build out of our new worship center over here. I just uh, want to address the question most people ask me when it comes to borrowing that money. Is that going to put any kind of a stress or strain on our campus, which will be responsible for handling that? And the answer is uh, emphatically no, because we were originally paying rent at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Since we've moved into this building, which we've owned, we haven't uh, touched or utilized that money for anything else. It'll be more than enough to cover the expenses of what that debt might incur, and we actually have a plan in place. I think we'll be able to pay off that loan within about three years uh, based on some financing situations that we have. So it's just something for us to continue to grow and expand to give you an idea. The new facility, most people don't necessarily understand this, but it is going to be about twice as much space as we currently utilize and operate here in the shopping center. We own this shopping center, the tenants that pay rent, which include the tenants that you see, as well as tenants like Chase Bank, who pays us to use the parking lot, the water mill that pays us to use the parking lot. Those pay the note on the building that we purchased here. And what this allows us to do is to expand and continue doing ministry, which at least amount of cost possible. And so what that allows us to do is we're going to expand into that space. It's going to give us a new 762-seat uh, worship center. It's going to be uh, very nice as opposed to this space, which I love, but is kind of rigged up in ghetto. And that's okay because we continue to reach people utilizing that. We'll have a, a real baptistry, a real children's ministry space with secure check-in. It'll be about three times as much children's ministry space that'll be available for us. It'll have real bathrooms as opposed to in the worship center, which I appreciate y'all not using this restroom in the front, which you probably don't know is here because that gets a little awkward while I'm preaching. But if I have to go during the message, it makes it real easy for me. You know, so it's just going to be a much nicer space. It's going to allow us to continue doing the ministry that God's been blessing us with for the last three years. And so I would consider, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to vote yes for that next weekend when we're voting on that. On Wednesday night, uh, we have two things going on. At 6 o'clock, we will have a question and answer time. If you've got questions about the budget or what we're doing here as a Kenner campus or the structure of how any of that money is working, I would be happy to answer any of that. Any questions about the new space, I'd be happy to answer that. Hopefully that space will be ready within the next three or four months, so we'll be moving uh, over to there. It's in the same building, just right in the corner, right over there. It used to be the French Riviera Fitness Center, and uh, we've been renovating that since November, and uh, it's going to be a great space. Everything's going to be great with it. Um, the other thing we're going to be doing on Wednesday night is we have our I Want to Know membership event at 630, and so if you want to kill two birds with one stone and attend both of those, and you haven't had a chance to join the church and become a member, we'll be doing that this coming Wednesday. I want to encourage you uh, to come and to show up for that. So with that being said, I want to turn our attention to the message for today. If you take out your worship guide, inside of it, there's some sermon notes you can follow along with today's message. We continue our 40 Days of Transformation sermon series. We're looking in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and today we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14. All of our verses will be up here on the screen behind me, as well as in your sermon notes, and you can utilize that to follow along with today's message. Our message today is titled, God's Plan, Our Purpose. The one thing we know is that life is filled with all kind of mysteries. Mysteries is simply nothing more than things you don't understand. And if you've been living for any sort of time, you know in life things happen that don't make sense to you all the time. Amen? Things you just can't quite understand. One of those mysteries is why there is so much tragedy and injustice in our world. I would say that for most Christians or for most people in the world, that's the question that gets asked most often. If there's a loving and caring God, why is there so much injustice and so much heartache and so much tragedy in this world? And the easy answer or the simple answer, let me say, is just because that's the sinful nature of man that is kind of running around. And because of God's uh, divine providence, because of his love for us, because of his compassion, in spite of our sin, he extends a hand to us to help us to be delivered from that. Because when we allow sin to reign and rule, it creates such carnal and chaos in our world. And we sometimes begin to wonder, man, is God present? Is God working? Does God have a plan? Is he active? Does he notice? And is he aware of what's happened? And the answer is emphatically yes. God's aware. God knows what's happening. And he's active and alive today. We see in Ephesians 1, Paul addressing this to the church 
in Ephesus that he started in what is modern-day Turkey. He said, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit of God is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So here we have in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul reminding the church in Ephesus, just like he's reminding us today, because their struggles were the same as our struggles. Their struggle is, did God see what's going on? And Paul is telling them, look, I want you to know God has a plan. And through his plan is how you find purpose for your life. I just want to break down some things that he's explaining to us through this, this passage in Ephesians. Here's the first thing we learn. I want you to write this down. You're taking notes, write this down. We learn from the Apostle Paul that, number one, God is carrying out his plan. God is carrying out his plan. He's not always carrying out our plans, because a lot of times our plans are different than God's plans, but he's carrying out his plan. In Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, it says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan, and this is the plan at the right time. Let's say that phrase, right time, together on three. One, two, three. The right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth will be brought under God's authority, under Christ's authority. This is God's plan, that Jesus will come back at just the right time. Now, one of the questions I get asked all the time as a pastor is, Pastor, is this the right time? The way people ask it is, do you think we're living... Living in the last days. Well, you know, we know from the scriptures a few things about the second coming of Jesus. We know from the scriptures that the culture of our world is becoming crazy. We're living in some crazy times, aren't we? It's amazing the things that happen. See, the Bible tells us that in the last days, the world's people will become more carnal. Carnal is the biblical world for the flesh. The sinful flesh, the desires of this world... I just want to read this passage for you, and then you tell me if you think we're living in the last days. I'll leave it up to you. It says this, in the last days, this is how you know it's coming, people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud. They'll be scoffing at God. They'll be disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. In the last days, they'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what's good. They'll betray their friends. People will be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. And they'll love pleasure rather than God. I don't know. What you think, yeah? You know, we got the Super Bowl coming up in a couple of weeks, which unfortunately the saints will not be in. Are you, have you recovered? My wife woke up yesterday. She said, I'm still not over it. I just want you to know I'm not over it. And in the Super Bowl, there'd be commercials. I remember a couple years ago, my, uh, my son Preston, he's, uh, he's eight now. He's about five. And he comes in after watching the Super Bowl, and he's dancing in the room, and he's like, I'm sexy, and I know it. Five years old. And I'm like, where did he hear this? It's a song. I know it's a song, but I'm like, where did he hear this? And then a commercial came on a few days later, and I realized where he heard it. He heard it from an Eminem's commercial. And it was the M&M's commercial came out in the Super Bowl, and it was the brown M&M, and she was this real sophisticated lady. And there were these people that were laughing at her, these guys. And she said, what are you laughing at? And she said, oh, they think that you're naked because you're brown. And she said, you think I would just show up to a party in my milk chocolate? And then the red M&M walks out, and he goes, oh, I see what kind of party this is. And he rips off his shell, and he starts dancing, and I'm sexy, and I know it. And I thought, time out. Did we just sexualize M&Ms? <laughs> Even M&Ms are not sacred, right? 
a kid's candy, Halloween candy, you know, Easter candy. Is it? Man, there's just nothing sacred in the world we live in. I don't know if it's the last days, but that's got to be close, right? See, most of the people in our world, they're devoted to hedonism, which is the love of pleasure, and materialism, which is the love of possessions, and humanism, which is the love of self. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world nor the things it offers to you, because when you love the world, then you don't have the love of the Father in you. This passage goes on in 1 John to talk about these three ideas, hedonism and materialism and humanism. It calls them in the Bible, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. That which feels good, wanting to have money and possessions, the lust of the eyes, wanting to look good, and the pride of life, the love of self. These things were true 2,000 years ago, and they're true today. These are the struggles that we face. In James 4, it says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? See, this world can be dangerous. It can manipulate you. It can lie to you. It can deceive you. And before you know it, you find yourselves outside of God's will, falling away from God's purpose and God's plan, because that's what the world offers. The Bible also tells us that the world's problems will become more chaotic. Matthew 24, talking about the end time, says, you'll hear of wars and threats of wars. There'll be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. People ask me, Pastor, is this the last days? I don't know. These are the Bible descriptions. What do you think? Then another thing we learn about God's plan being brought is that we learn that the return of Jesus is the hope of the world. So yeah, the world's going crazy. Yeah, the world's going chaotic. Yeah, the world's got problems and the world's got sin. But that doesn't mean as a Christian you're without hope because Jesus is the hope of the world. See, what everyone needs is they need Jesus. That's why they were talking about those shirts that we're selling. I want you to order one of those. You can order them on the church website. Why? Because I want you to walk around letting everybody know that you believe everyone needs Jesus. At the end of the day, that's who we are as a church. That's our church. People say, what's the church's mission statement? It's simple. Everyone needs Jesus. That's the mission. Because we believe that if Jesus just got a hold of somebody, that Jesus could literally and personally transform and change their lives. That's what people really need. They don't need more money. They don't need a better job. They don't need a promotion and a raise at work. They don't need to get married or to be single or to get divorced or to have kids or to not have kids. What people really need at the end of the day is everyone needs Jesus. And if they just got Jesus, that would solve all the problems that they're facing because Jesus is the hope of the world. See, the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back to the world, he's going to rescue and reward his followers. It tells us that he's going to defeat fully and finally Satan and all his evil forces. He's going to judge the inhabitants of the earth, and Jesus is going to establish his eternal kingdom here on earth. That's what we need. We need Jesus to show up. In Titus 2, it says we're instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to the wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Jesus needs to come back. And while we're awaiting his return, what do we need to do? It's simple. We live with wisdom. We live with righteousness. And we live with devotion to God. And that's the way God has called us to live. That's who we're called to be. We're to live the godly lives that God has called us to while we're waiting the Lord's return. Making a difference for good and for God all in the world around us. That is what God has called us to do. And when you begin to understand that this is God's plan and this is God's purpose. When we live in God's plan, that's when we find the purpose that we're so looking for in life. We all need to experience that. And the only way you experience it. Is by really walking in God's plan, that wisdom, that righteousness, that devotion to God, in spite of the chaos and the crazy world that you find yourselves in. We learn from this passage that God is carrying out his plan. We also learn that God is blessing his people. I want you to write that down. God's blessing his people. In verse 11, it says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God because he chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. He makes everything work out according to his plan. I got a friend of mine, i never forget this, he told me, he said, man, everything's going to be all right in the end. And if everything's not all right, then it's not the end. That's what you believe as a Christian. God's going to work it out. You ever wonder that? I don't know how this is going to work out. You ever been in that situation before? Man, I don't know financially how this is going to work out. 
I don't know how this job situation is going to work out. I don't know how this marriage is going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out with these kids. I might need a different set. It's a good thing that you can't return your kids like you can return stuff to Walmart because the line would be long. I know. I don't know how this is going to work out. Listen to me. God will work it out. That's one of the things you got to believe as a Christian. You got to wake up in the morning, look at all the chaos and the turmoil around you and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but the one thing I know and the one thing I believe is that you're going to work this out. You're going to work this out according to your plan. I don't know how this is going to pan out. I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know that God does, and I will trust in him. See, that's faith. Faith doesn't rule by circumstance. That's why the Bible says, as a Christian, you need to walk by faith and not by sight. Because what you see can be depressing. What you see can be discouraging. What you see can be defeating. But if you walk by faith, you realize that Jesus can be defeated. Jesus can be discouraged. Jesus can be depressed. He can be held down. That's who he is. I got to trust in the Lord. See, as people who have been adopted into God's family, the Bible tells us we have this great inheritance. We have received an inheritance. See, the Lord is planning on blessing his people with an extraordinary life on earth. Write that down. We read this in John 10. It says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Some translations say an abundant life. The word here is extraordinary, extraordinary. Extra means beyond. Ordinary means ordinary. So God's plan is to give you a life that is beyond ordinary. Do you really want to live an ordinary life? Just go to the grocery store and just scan the people who are there. Does everybody look like they're having a good time at the grocery store? Go to the DMV and just scan the people there. I don't know if you can find a more miserable set of people than at Troop B. Right? Just scan the world you live in. Just see your neighbors. Just go, just look at the people you work with. Just walk into work and scan around. How's everybody doing? You want an ordinary life? Is that what you want? Or you want the extraordinary life that God has promised to bless you with? The only way we understand satisfaction is in a temporary way. That's the only way we understand it. See, most people think that success and failure are permanent conditions. They're not. Success and failure are temporary conditions. The only way we understand satisfaction is in a temporary sense, in a temporary sense. So we see things, and the only way we can understand them is in a temporary sense. We think, man, if I got that, I would be satisfied. But as soon as you get it, guess what happens? You adjust, right? You get accustomed to it, right? We did a, a fast just, a, a, you know, last week. We, we, we wrapped it up, and uh, I, I did my fast, and I got a habit when I'm fasting, going without solid food. We were doing it corporately as a group. I hope you were participating. Amen. We can tell by your waistlines who were. Don't worry. Body don't lie. And during my fast, as I get to the end of it, I find myself lusting after food. I find myself at about day seven, day eight, planning what my next meal is going to be. I'm like a death row inmate, you know? What's my final meal? And I know it gets real bad when I get really close to the end because I start watching diners, drive-ins, and dives on the Food Network. And I'm just looking, evaluating what I'm going to tear up when I get this moment. And I had my first meal. And that night, my stomach was hurting so bad. And while I was eating, I was like, man, this is so satisfying. But that satisfaction was temporary. And it's such a picture of everything else. Some of you, you've had this experience. You got a raise at work. You thought it was a good raise. And as soon as you did the math on your budget, you realized that ain't nothing. Because you adjust to it. You adjust to it. I've never met anybody who has said to me, Pastor, I got this money. I don't know what to do with it. It's amazing how we figure that out. Because it's temporary. You know, I was thinking about this. New England Patriots still in the playoffs. Tom Brady trying to win. Why? Go home, Tom. You won. It's over. 
You got the most rings. You the best. Retire. He can't retire. You know why? Because he still got to win. Why? Because the winning is the only way he can get satisfaction or so he thinks. But as soon as he wins, guess what happens? Got to win again. Got to win again. Can't let it go. Because he's chasing what is temporary. And that's what the most of the world around us is. It's just a bunch of Tom Brady's. Chasing something they think is going to satisfy them, but it's not. And that's why they can't let it go. They can't retire. They can't die. See, most, even most Christians, they're not trying to go to heaven right now because they're still in love with this world. You want to go to heaven? Yeah, but just not yet. Let me get a little more of this world in. That's not the life God wants for you. God wants to bring you a rich and a satisfying life. See, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he brings us purpose. And in John 14, he brings us peace. In Philippians 4, he brings us provision. And in 2 Corinthians 5, he brings us the power to change our lives. See, those are the things that are really satisfying. When you know your life has purpose, when you know you have peace in your life no matter what's happening around you, and that God is the one providing for you so you'll always be taken care of and that there's nothing in your life that can't change. That's what it means to have the extraordinary life. And then God's plan is to bless his people with eternal life in heaven. John 3, Jesus said the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. As a Christian, your eternal life begins the moment you surrender your life to God, the moment you repent of your sins, the moment you give your life to God and become what the Bible born again. The old person dies, a new person comes alive, and the new person has a future to look forward to, which is eternal life in heaven. This world, this body, everything we understand is temporary, it is fading away, but that's not the soul that you have. You have an eternal soul. We like to think that we are physical beings having a temporary spiritual experience, but the reality is we are all spiritual beings having a temporary physical human experience. This life is dying and fading away, and so is the world around us. It should not surprise you in any way. That's why your focus instead should be on that which is heaven. Revelation 21, John the Apostle said, I saw the holy city in a dream, a vision. He was brought up into heaven, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God is home now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. I'll get to the Holy Spirit in just a minute. And of course, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us and the presence of God is here on this earth. But the reality is while we're on earth and God is in heaven, in a sense, we have a long distance relationship. And if you've ever been in a long distance relationship, you know, you can't wait to be together. That's what you want. That's what your desire is. And it's no different with God. The Lord's home will be with us. We will be together, united with God. God will be with us and he will wipe away every tear and there'll be no more death and there'll be no more sorrow. As much as we can experience some of the heavenly life while here on earth, there are a few things, there are many things that we can't experience until we get to heaven itself. See, in heaven, that's where we enjoy the Lord's presence and his rewards. And we'll be given assignments from him to carry out his plan. The Lord wants to bless us with an extraordinary life here on earth and eternal life in heaven. And then we learn from the Apostle Paul that God has kept his promise. He's carrying out his plan. He's blessing his people. And then God has kept his promise. In Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. Now, I want you to understand this. I want you to circle two, two words in that verse right there. The first uh, word I want you to circle is the word identified. Identified. Now, in the Greek language, this is the word sealed. God has sealed us. Now, we've talked about this here before. Typically, we think of sealing something as closing it. But that's not what the word seal really means. The word seal has a different implication. It technically is to leave your mark on something. The picture is, you know, remember like the little wax seal and they would write a letter and they would roll it up and they would put that hot wax and then they would press their seal into it. Well, let's say if you go and get a marriage license today, when you get your marriage license back, it comes from the clerk of court's office, but there is a seal that has been pressed into it, a mark that has been left on it to show that it's an official document. See, in the times this was written, a seal symbolized three things. One, it symbolized a finished transaction. 
When something was finished, the way you would get a receipt or the way something was closed or the way something was set is that it would put a seal on it to let people know this is officially finished and over and done with. This is officially closed. And it's a picture that when God seals us, when God identifies us with his Holy Spirit, that God has sealed his transaction with us. He has purchased us. We now belong to him. We are God's. We follow him. We serve him. It's God's mark on us to show. Then it was also a mark of ownership. It was a mark of ownership. It's interesting that Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesians because in Ephesus, it was known as the center of lumber producing in the area of Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. That's one of the things Ephesus was known for. They produced all the lumber. And those who manufactured lumber in those days, what they would do is, as they were cutting their logs, they would actually take a brand, a seal, and burn it into the logs. That way, when the logs went out, they could show that they owned those logs. It was a mark of ownership. In the same way, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in our lives, it's a mark that we now belong to God, that we, God is an owner of us, that we're his, his children. We can inherit from him. And then the seal was also a mark of security and protection. You remember when Pontius Pilate put Jesus in the tomb? He said, put him in a tomb and then seal it shut. And he put his own seal on it to show that he was the one who was securing it and protecting it. But he didn't do a very good job, did he? See, the world's seal can't hold God in, but God's seal can hold us in. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, it is a sign that God keeps us secure and God protects us and God owns us and God has finished the work that he's doing in our lives. Then as it goes down, it says we've been sealed by God and it also says that the spirit is God's guarantee. See, the idea is when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you at the moment of salvation. Now, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit as an ongoing act, sometimes daily, Sometimes more than daily, depending on where you work. But you need the Holy Spirit of God to live in you and to fill you. But the Holy Spirit comes in your life when you give your life to him. And the Bible says that the Spirit is God's guarantee. God's guarantee. Now, there's different words we would use for this in uh, today's time. We would use terms like um, a deposit or a down payment or earnest money. These are ideas that when you're going to purchase something, you put a down payment on it to show what? You're serious about it. You're willing to take the risk because this is going to be a finished transaction. You intend on bringing this to completion. And here's what God says. I intend on bringing you to heaven and to show you, to prove to you that I'm going to bring you to heaven. I'm going to give you the down payment, the deposit of the Holy Spirit right now. The Holy Spirit is going to come to live in you. The Holy Spirit is going to come to fill you. The Holy Spirit is going to come to be one with you. This was the idea of who God was. God promised this in the Old Testament in Joel chapter 2. Peter said it like this. Each of you must repent of your sins. Turn to God and be baptized to show that you have received forgiveness for your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live in your life when you repent of your sins, when you give your life to God. The Holy Spirit comes in you. Now, how do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? See, some people, some churches, some Christians teach and believe that you know you have the Holy Spirit if you have certain gifts of the Holy Spirit. Maybe the gift of tongues means you have the Holy Spirit. Maybe the gift of prophecy means you have the Holy Spirit. Some people teach that it's when you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When you exude the fruits of the Holy Spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit. How do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? Well, I think it's real simple to know whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. There are three things the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit does within us. And I think if you don't have these things, then it would question to me whether you got the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you, whether you ever really repented of your sins and you ever given your life to God. This is how you know. This is the way you tell. You can know you have the Holy Spirit within you because you have his conviction in your life. In John 16, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness. Now, there are some pastors who believe it's their job to convict people of their sin. They think it's their job. I'm not one of those people. I don't feel like it's my job to convict you of your sin. I think that's the Holy Spirit's job. I've heard pastors say things like, you know, this is what it is. If you don't like it, you can let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Get out. Right? 
I know some pastors, they want, let's bring up the sins y'all are struggling with in the congregation. Matter of fact, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, let's bring... that's not the pastor's job. That's not our spouse's job. Whose job is it? The Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. Now, what's the difference between conviction and guilt? Well, the picture in the New Testament is very clear. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he had guilt. And so he hung himself. And when Peter betrayed Jesus, he had conviction. And so he surrendered his life back to God in humility and repentance. And God used Peter to build the church, and God didn't use Judas to do anything. Most people feel guilty when they sin. That's not the same thing as conviction. Conviction is what draws you back to God and says, man, I can't live like this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. See, guilt says, man, I shouldn't eat this donut, but oh well. Conviction says, I'm never going to eat a donut again. I couldn't possibly do this to God because of the offense that it brings him. I can't live like this anymore. When you're really convicted, and you can't live with yourself, you got to change. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the Bible tells us we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can silence the Holy Spirit. Stop talking to me. Stop letting me know. That's something we can certainly do. But the reality is when you really live in for God and the Holy Spirit lives in you and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you have conviction for the sin in your life. You have conviction. Now, I've got to do something different. And conviction always breeds humility. So that when somebody calls you out on it, you receive it. You have conviction. You're motivated to do something different. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have his direction for your life. John 16 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit gives us direction as he speaks to us in an inaudible voice in our mind and in our hearts. We see this in Acts 13. Romans 8 says the true children of God are those who let God's spirit lead them. See, when you really got the Holy Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit begins to give you guidance and direction and help you discern which steps to take, which things to say. When you mature in Christ, you begin to understand his direction, and so you make every decision based upon the direction the Holy Spirit gives you. You begin to pray and say, all right, Holy Spirit, I need you to lead me. Is this the job that I'm supposed to take? Is this the house that I should buy? Is this where I should invest my money? Is this the person I should be in a relationship with? You know, it's amazing. Let's say you get married and you prayed about it. You really felt like the Holy Spirit led you to marry a person. When you start to hit rough times and you come back to what God has said. And the Holy Spirit really led you. You say, all right, I better work this out because this is God's will. This is God's plan. This is where the Holy Spirit led me to go. When you just make the decision on your own human effort, you begin to say things like, well, I just probably made a bad decision. Just end this thing. Get over this. This ain't going to be what works out. When the Holy Spirit gives you guidance and direction and you start to say, all right, Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation, this offense? All right, my brother, my sister, my parents said this to me and it hurt my feelings and it made me mad and it frustrated me. All right, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to deal with it? You think the Holy Spirit says, cut them off, never talk to them ever again? Or you think that's your flesh? What's the Holy Spirit say? Humble yourself. You go ahead and apologize first. I knew I shouldn't have asked you. You ain't had that moment. The Holy Spirit ain't leading you, you know? And then you experience his transformation. Galatians 5, the Spirit produces. The Spirit produces. Not you. The Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, the godly changes that take place in our lives after we accept Jesus are a result of the Holy Spirit transforming us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like Jesus. The transforming work of God should be happening in your life. How do you know the Holy Spirit's at work in your life? Real simple. You've changed. You've changed. I ran into a friend. He knows somebody I went to high school with. He told him that I was his pastor. And the guy said, wait, wait, time out. Manly Miller's a pastor? Greatest compliment in the world. Why? Because it's a mark, this ain't me. It's transformation. Listen, 
if you was angry when you gave your life to the Lord and you still angry today, that concerns me. If you were depressed when you gave your life to the Lord and you still depressed, the Holy Spirit's not doing his job. If you had anxiety when you came to the Lord and you still got the same level of anxiety, I know if you struggle with anxiety, you're going to have anxiety the rest of your life, but it should be less. There should be transformation and change. If you was prideful when you gave your life to the Lord, and you just as prideful as you were there, man, the Lord's not transforming you. The mark of the Holy Spirit of God is change and transformation in our lives. And if you don't know what you need to change, just go around and ask your friends and your family. Hey, I'm doing a survey. You think there's anything I need to change? Well, as a matter of fact, I've got a New Testament word. <laughs> yeah, we need to change. And we come to the Holy Spirit of God and we say, all right, Holy Spirit, how do you need to change me? How do you need to change me? You know, right now in my life, I was telling my wife this yesterday. I said, um, you know, the Lord's been at work in my life for a long time, helping to teach me how to grieve. And y'all know, my mother passed away recently. And I told my wife, I said, I'm not grieving well. And I was grieving pretty good before she passed. But since she's passed, I just say, you know what? I'm not grieving like I need to be. That means in my life, in that area, my flesh is in control. Because when Jesus found out that his closest friend Lazarus passed, he wept. And the Bible tells us that we can even grieve the Holy Spirit by how we leave. The Holy Spirit knows how to grieve. So in my own life, I got to do the work I need to do to let the Holy Spirit take over and transform. Because this is who God wants me to be. That's God's plan. That's God's blessing. That's God's extraordinary life. Not the ordinary life. That's God's work within me to transform me and change me into who I need to be to be like him. We always need to evaluate ourselves and look deep within and say, all right, Lord, where do I need to change? Where do I need to be transformed? Where do I need to be made like you? Where do I need to be convicted? What direction are you giving me? How are you wanting to change me? We need to reassert all the time the Holy Spirit's leadership of our lives because that's God's plan and God's purpose and God's blessing and God's promise. Let's all stand together this morning. I want you to take a minute and bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to pray a prayer of reflection with me this morning. I want you to say, pray with me out loud, Lord Jesus, speak to me through this message and show me how I need to change. Convict me. Humble me. Help me to receive from you. Let me be in tune with your Holy Spirit who wants to give me the blessed and extraordinary life. Seal me and remind me I'm built for eternal life in heaven. Show me your plan. Show me your purpose and help me to stay focused on you. I ask that you would transform my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.